mercy and blessings of Allah be with you all. Thank you for joining me for this live post in which I describe and discuss Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. <laughs> so last week I doubled up, I did chapter 7 and 8, so today, chapter 9. So as usual, I will uh, go to, I can go to uh, various uh, Bible softwares. I've often uh, gone to Bible Hub. Let's try Bible Gateway today. Bible Gateway dot something. Let me see where it is. Uh, BibleGateway.com. Okay. So here, um, let's see what uh, choices we have. So the NIV version Bible comes up first. Oh, New Catholic Bible. That's interesting. Uh, once in a while, we should try that too. Um, New Catholic Bible. Hmm. And then we have Mount's Reverse Interlinear New Testament. Oh, lots of good um, um, resources here. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, complete Jewish Bible as well. Uh, contemporary English version, Darby translation, uh, Douay Reims. Uh, okay, so let's go with a Catholic version today. It's going to be much the same uh, for the passages that we're doing. The main difference between the Catholic and the Protestant uh, versions uh, is that the Catholic version uh, includes seven additional books uh, for the Old Testament. Uh, so since we're dealing with the New Testament, not that much difference. But uh, what differences uh, may um uh, a crew would be um, accreditable uh, to choices among the manuscript versions. So if there's a verse that reads one way in one manuscript, another way in a ma another manuscript, the Protestant scholars may have chosen one and the Catholic scholars may have chosen the other one. In particular, in the um, Revised Standard Version of the Bible 1952 edition, uh, some passages were taken out uh, because they were not found in earliest manuscripts. Then uh, some were put back in the 1970s version and then the uh, Catholic uh, version in particular of the Revised Standard Version um, as far as I can remember uh, seeing it some time ago they had different choices into you know as to what they put back in and what they left out so but most of what we're going to read is going to be the same for Catholics and Protestants so uh, let's get a, a, a feel for a Catholic uh, version today um, so this is the New American, oh, New American Bible is here. This is one of my favorites. Actually, I'll go to this one. Let me see. New American Bible, um, revised edition, New American Bible. Uh, now, I'll tell you why the New American Bible is um, one of my favorites. Um, it's um, because in, in the St. Joseph medium size edition that I've been accustomed to reading, there are a lot of um, important footnotes, uh, well, explanatory comments uh, there at the bottom of the page. And um, th those have proven to be very useful in understanding the text and also useful to me in, in dialogue. All right, so now uh, I'm in the New American Bible and I want to go to Matthew chapter Eight. So let me see how easy it is to navigate here. I want to go read the Bible. Um, read the Bible. Advanced search, available versions. Available versions for reading. Let me see. Um, so we want to go New American Bible. New, New American Bible Revised Edition. So it's here. Okay, so then I can go. So if I pick read the Bible on the top left, then I pick the version uh, as I'm prompted. And then I go to the list of all Bible passages. So then I can uh, scroll down to where I want. I have to scroll down, scroll down past the Old Testament. I go to the New Testament section. And then I go to Matthew. And there are uh the chapter is listed so i pick chapter nine which is where we are okay so chapter nine healing of a paralytic he that is jesus entered a boat uh, made the crossing and came into his own town and there people brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher okay so 
Um, before I read any further, let me pay att some attention to the uh, comments and uh, see that everything looks good. I see some salams and no red flags, so that means I take it that the sound and uh, video are good. And I see that Abu Bakr, uh, Samaila, uh, Yayu, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, brother, uh, has shared the stream. Thank you very much for that, brother Abu Bakr. And uh, I encourage others to do the same as well. If you feel that I offer something good, please offer it to others as well. Okay, so now, so uh, we are at BibleGateway.com. I'm reading from the New uh, American Bible um, Revised Edition. So while this has been my favorite Bible for decades, I didn't realize it was here available uh, so easily online. Okay, uh, so. Uh, he entered a boat, I'm reading again from the top, uh, uh, chapter 9. He entered a boat, made, a, made the crossing, and came into his own town. And there people brought to him a paralytic lying, lying on a stretcher. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Courage, child, your sins are forgiven. At that, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. Jesus knew what they were thinking and said, Why do you harbor evil thoughts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? Uh, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your stretcher, and go home. He rose and went home. When the crowds saw this, they were struck with awe and glorified God who had given such authority to human beings. Um, yeah, actually, now that I'm reading it, I realize that um, we may have... Um, read this before we may have done this chapter 9 um, yeah we, we did chapter 9 so today I should be doing chapter 10 chapter 10 I'm gonna jump forward to chapter 10 um, yeah in this uh, version here could I jump forward yeah chapter 10 so today we're doing chapter 10 despite the uh, label I have to change the label for this video so Matthew chapter 10 the mission of the twelve. And then he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority uh, over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, uh, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and uh, Thaddeus, uh, Simon the Canaan. Uh, Cananean and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Of course, this is, um, you know, in a way from the point of view of the storyline, this is like reading forward because Judas didn't betray him yet. So um, Judas who will betray him in, in the future. But of course, from the writer's point of view, uh, the writer is all writing, is writing from past tense. You know, the writer, from the writer's point of view, these events already happened. So this is uh, uh, given that the writer is writing a long time after these uh, events. Now, the names of these uh, disciples, uh, the, the, the list of names is interesting, and the, and the list does not totally tally uh, with uh, the list given in the other Gospels, in Matthew and, uh, and Luke. Uh, sorry, in Mark and Luke. So we have the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They run side by side. They can be seen together. And we can see that the storyline is very similar between among the three Gospels. Um, and where the list of uh, names are given of the 12 disciples, we find variations, which means that uh, somebody uh, modified the list a little bit. And uh, not much, but most of the names are in common, but there are a few uh, differences. Uh, one of the key differences is that um, in in Matthew um, in Matthew's gospel, the, ma the, the tax collector is called Matthew, um, whereas he's called the Levi in another, and 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 that's one of the reasons why this gospel has been given the name the Gospel of Matthew, probably as a short way of uh, referring to the fact that uh, this one mentions Matthew as opposed to the uh, the others. It's almost like a surah of the Quran being referred to by a particular word in that uh, in that surah, and that gives the surah its name, I mean in common parlance, so people refer to it by that word. Um, okay, so uh, the, uh, and the, the fact that the disciples' names uh, do not um, 
uh, line up uh, from one gospel to another, uh, that, that shows the nature of human memory. People did not remember things so exactly. And uh, another issue is that uh, the disciples themselves uh, did not all become so famous. Uh, like, for example, if we ask about Alphaeus, uh, very little is known about him. And Thaddeus, uh, again, very, very, very little. Um, and there is a Simon the Cananean, uh, as opposed to Simon Peter. Simon called Peter. That is, so there are two Simons among the disciples of uh, of Jesus. And James is a popular name. So we have James here, son of Alphaeus, and then we have James, brother of Jesus. And uh, you know, you could have many other Jameses uh, at that time because it was a popular name. Um, so these uh, disciples, sometimes uh, our Christian friends say, say to us Muslims, well, you know what, um, that the disciples died for their faith. And if they had not believed uh, that Jesus resurrected from the dead and appeared to them, uh, they would not have died for, you know, they died for that belief. This is what is commonly said. Uh, but we can say that the disciples, uh, first of all, it's not so clear that they all died for their faith. Only, uh, you know, it's only recorded of uh, Peter, not in the Bible, but extraneously. And in the Bible uh, of, of James and John, James, James, James was killed. Um, and, and John, the son of Zebedee, is uh, um, considered to have lived to a ripe old age of about 90 uh, so that he compiled uh, the uh, gospel according to John, according in, in Christian tradition. So he lived a long time. Matthew, too, lived a long time to be writing the gospel according to Matthew. Um, and um, so it, to, to say that the disciples were all um, uh, killed because of their faith, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, and then what faith were they killed for? That, that's another issue. Even those who died, um, did they die um, with the developed faith of uh, common, commonly known Christianity today? Or did they uh, die with the faith that was known from Christians at the time? And I would say at the time, obviously, otherwise it'll be anachronistic to say that, you know, they believed in all the things that Christians believe today after all of the developments. So key things uh, that uh, they may not have believed in uh, could have been like the, the divinity of Jesus so and, uh, and the Trinity doctrine. And, and God knows best. All right, uh, the commissioning of the 12. We're reading now from verse number five. Jesus sent out these 12 after instructing them thus, uh, do not go in, into pagan territory or enter a, Samarian, a Samaritan town. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, ra raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Uh, without cost uh, you have received. Uh, without cost you are to give. Do not take gold or silver or copper for your belts, no sack for the journey, or a second tunic, or sandals, or walking stick. Uh, the laborer deserves his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, look for a worthy person in it, and stay there until you leave. As you enter a house, wish it peace. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If not, let your peace return to you. Uh, whoever will not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that house or town and shake the dust from your feet amen i say to you it will be more tolerable for the land of sodom and gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town okay very interesting passage here uh, requiring our comments at uh, some uh, important junctures so uh, he jesus sent out the 12 disciples uh, according to this and he tells them do not go into the pagan territory or enter a samarian town go um, rather to the lost uh, sheep of the house of israel uh, later on in the same gospel in chapter 15 verse 24 i believe it is jesus will say i've not been sent except to the lost sheep of the house of israel so he's very specific and that uh, aligns with the Quran's um, depiction of Jesus, where Jesus, uh, according to the Quran, says uh, that uh, I have been sent Warasulan ila bani Israel. I have been sent to the people of Israel. And um, here in in Matthew's Gospel, it's given as an exception. I have not been sent except. So um, it's it's. Um, 
it's a kind of a double negative uh, that that makes it very specific. Uh, whereas in the Quran, it's not given in the double negative. It says that he is sent to the people of Israel, but that leaves the way open for his message to be received by others as well, if they so choose or if it so happens that the message reaches them. Should be no restriction, right? Not uh, exclusive to that uh, people. Uh, seven, verse number seven, as you go make this proclamation, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So uh, what is meant by the kingdom of heaven here? We, we've seen previously that in what is referred to as the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, uh, thy kingdom come, uh, that, which means that they're asking God for his rule to be on earth. Uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as you are ruling in heaven and your will is carried out in heaven, let your will be carried out on earth as well. So that's the prayer. And um, uh, the, the, here too, the proclamation of Jesus is said to be that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is at hand means it's going to happen any time. Um, and, and some have taken this to mean that Jesus was what they call an apocalyptic prophet. He is uh, preaching uh, that the end of time is going to happen, like the last day, the uh, final battle and all of that uh, is going to take place very soon. Uh, okay, verse number eight, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Uh, now, uh, drive out demons is interesting. The, the, all of these are interesting that the disciples are given the power uh, and the ability and the permission to go out and do all these things. They will cure the sick, they will raise the dead. Imagine the disciples going around and raising the dead people back to life. Now, in the Gospels, there is no um, uh, mention of the disciples bringing anyone back to life. But in Acts of the Apostles, um, and we see this happening, which is after Jesus uh, had left the scene, that the, the, the Peter in particular is able to bring a dead woman back to life. Uh, but we, we delay that until we get to uh, the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this fact because, you know, I've debated many uh, Christians who are very serious about their Bibles, but I haven't heard anyone uh, say, you know what, uh, and, and Peter raised this woman Dorcas back to life. So that shows that the power of Jesus continued to be um, with the disciples. I'm not sure if uh, our Christian friends actually uh, champion these, um, like, uh, do, do we find, in, in, has anyone found that in a debate, for example, um, when, you know, we are talking about the message of Jesus and how it was carried on in the early church, uh, I, I know that, uh, you know, the, the apologists will say, well, the disciples died for their faith. But um, does anyone mention that uh, in this vein that, OK, uh, but the disciples also, you know, were curing the sick and raising the dead, especially raising the dead, which is a very um, um, significant uh, ability to have to, to raise the dead. I want to say something about driving out demons. Now, uh, in in the uh, in the Bible, obviously, of course, again and again, we see that Jesus is driving out demons. In in the New Test, in in the um, in the Quran, on the other hand, when the miracles of Jesus are uh, delineated, uh, it is not mentioned that he used to drive out demons. Now, I think this is a curious uh, difference because in in the Quran itself, I don't find evidence that um, you know demon possession is a is a reality that uh, that must be dealt with and of course that demons have to be expelled or exorcised in, in the way that we find in in practice we find uh, you know there are Muslim practitioners who will drive out demons but I don't find that this is actually based on the Quran nor is it based on the most authentic collections of hadith uh, it uh, seems to be more based on obscure traditions which some people try to argue is uh, are authentic and so on but um, the the most authoritative collections no um, so that's interesting all right so um, and he says in verse number 10 uh, no sack for the journey or a tunic or sandals or walking stick. Uh, but in, in Mark, on the other hand, there is an exception, except the walking stick. So that means they can't take any of these other things, but they can take a walking stick. Whereas here in Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 10, uh, they are not allowed to take a walking stick. So many see this as a clear contradiction uh, between Matthew and, and Mark, uh, and, and which is interesting because Matthew is using Mark, uh, we are told, uh, by modern, uh, even Christian scholars, and uh, Matthew has um, here chosen to change the story. So why might he change the story to say, and not even the walking stick? 
Uh, some some believe that the as the community progressed, uh, the idea of being more and more ascetic kicked in, and so it's more ascetic to not have anything, not even the staff, and here they're uh, being denied even to, to take a sta uh, staff. Now, those who want to reconcile this and say, oh, but you know, it's all the same, and this means that, and there's no contradiction, will try to, you know, uh, dwell on uh, the specific wording used, uh, wh you know, what's a stick called in this, what's a stick called in there, is the Greek word similar, different, it's a different type of stick, and so on. But, uh, you know, respect of, uh, respectable uh, commentaries uh, on, on the New Testament uh, admit, like, for example, the interpreter's Bible um, admits uh, that there is a, a contradiction here between the two. Okay, so... Um, Yeah, the word amen, amen. The word amen is similar to our word amin in in the um, in the like when we recite the Quran, um, um, we we say amin at the end of Surah Al-Fatiha. It means like something. Let it be so. I agree to that. Um, is, and um, uh, here the term is amin in in uh, amen in in verse number fifteen of of Matthew chapter ten. So it's basically the same word from the Semitic uh, languages. And haimana um, uh, in, in Arabic is said to have a possible meaning of saying amin to what was there before. Uh, so in, in Surah 5, verse number 48, uh, it says, uh, uh, We have revealed to you the book uh, uh, confirming that which was there previously of, of the um, scriptures. And um, saying amin to it in a way, like confirming uh, that which was there before. That's one meaning of uh, haimana, uh, to say amin to according to the classical Muslim commentaries. Of course, another meaning is that it is a kind of a protector or guardian over um, that because sometimes a word can have two different meanings just like in english a word can have several meanings so so too the word haimana in in arabic and um, so some see that verse as meaning that the quran is to be a kind of a quality control on the previous uh, books but of course it can have this other meaning as i just mentioned okay so now we go to continuing the reading um i want to be able to finish this chapter at least before going to your comments and so we go to um a Verse number 16, verse number 16. Now the chapter, this sectional heading says coming persecutions. So it's going to prepare the disciples for what is going to happen to them in the future. People are going to persecute them because they believe in Jesus. So coming persecutions, verse number 16. Behold, I'm sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. Uh, be aware, of, uh, but beware of people, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues and you will be held before governors and kings for my sake as a witness before them and the pagans when they hand you over do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say you will be given at that moment what you are to say for it will not be you who speak but the spirit of your father speaking through you a brother will hand over brother to death and the father his child children will rise up against parents and have them put to death you will be hated by all because of my name but whoever endures to the end will be saved. Uh, when uh, they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen. I say to you, you will not finish uh, the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. No disciple is above his teacher, no slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, uh, for the slave that he become, uh, uh, for the slave that he become like his master. So it is enough for the slave that he becomes like his master. If they have called the master of the house uh, Belzebul, uh, uh, how? Uh, much more those of his household. So I'm going to take a drink of water, a sip of water here. Bismillah. And now I uh, go to um, now I uh, go to the commentary. So a few things here are worthy of uh, mention. Uh, so I'm sending you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and simple as doves. So that's an interesting um, um, 
uh, line, uh, you know, be as shrewd as, uh, as serpents or and, and simple as doves. I think some other um, a translation says, you know, be sly as foxes and uh, and and simple as doves, something like this. So, um, uh, so so be simple with people, you know, be ordinary, um, go along with what people are asking you to do and so on. But still, like, be aware. And and this is a good. Um, uh, piece of advice for Muslims as well like be simple and 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 you know don't don't put on ears and appear to be so sophisticated and and so on but at the same time be be and um, you know be clever um, don't don't be naive and be taken for granted okay so verse number seven beware of people because they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in synagogues and you'll be left before read before governors and kings for my sake as a witness before them in uh, uh, and the pagans so uh, the disciples are being prepared for this persecution. Now, that's an interesting uh, phenomenon because our uh, Christian friends tell us that Jesus died for our sins so that uh, he bore the penalty which everybody else should have borne. And uh, you might think that when Jesus has already borne all of that penalty, then nobody else will have any penalty. Like, you know, uh, life should return to paradise, uh, paradisaic condition, conditions. And, um, you know, everybody should be happy, especially his followers. But no, his followers are being prepared uh, for persecution to come, which means that Jesus suffered and his disciples are going to suffer in a similar way. Uh, in fact, uh, perhaps even more because... Um, you know, a father is going to put his child to death and so on. Um, and children will put their parents to death. There is, there's going to be all this turmoil um, just over this message. And then uh, the question about the Holy Spirit here. So it is not you who will speak, but the spirit of the father, uh, of your father speaking through you. So first of all, it is your father. So the uh, the disciples have a father and, and the same father is the father of Jesus from in this narrative. Not that Muslims use this language, but within the context of the Gospels here, uh, it is especially the Gospel of the, the Synoptic Gospels. And in Matthew here in particular, as we're dealing with it, uh, the father here can be taken in a metaphor metaphorical sense uh, the father is the father of Jesus and also the father of the disciples uh, so it is um, uh, he's the father of all and uh, the spirit speaking this that is the spirit of the father so is the spirit a separate and distinct person from the father or is it like we say you know my spirit uh, you know am I speaking of somebody distinct no I'm speaking about myself but it's a different way of referring to myself so uh, sometimes it is clear that this is what is meant that uh, it is the spirit of God not a separate and distinct person uh, as the third person of the Holy Trinity as believed uh, by the, the majority of Christians to Today. And of course, as you know, I have had a debate about this uh, on this specific topic uh, with uh, William Albrecht, and that could be found easily online uh, somewhere on a, as a YouTube video. Uh, so uh, that, that's one aspect of what I want to say about the Holy Spirit here. The other aspect is that, you know, the, the disciples are being told that uh, it, it won't be you who speak, but the spirit of your father who will be speaking through you. Of course, they will be speaking. Um, but, uh, you know, because they appear in court, they're obviously speaking, but the spirit of the Father is speaking through them. Um, this promise of the Holy Spirit speaking through the Christians and uh, being uh, present and defending them and so on in courtrooms uh, is not something we see playing out in the modern world. Like, uh, you know, we've all seen these television dramas, uh, courtroom dramas, uh, I don't know, what are they called? Um, um, law and order and so on so you know uh, you, you can see christians on both sides preparing uh, the lawyers are prepping their clients you know to go and appear this is how you speak and whatever uh, but there there is no and nobody seems to rely on the holy spirit anymore to speak through them and um, so it's not clear that uh, this promise is uh, something that christians are alive with today um, or that this promise is alive among Christians, if I put it in a different way. Okay, verse number 21, brother and so on, will hand over. And um, 
So the disciples are to go through the town of, towns of Israel, but they will not finish going through the towns of Israel, says verse number 23, before the Son of Man comes. So who is the Son of Man? Because you notice here, the Son of Man is being spoken about in the third person. Now, um, it, when we were commenting on the Gospel according to Mark, we pointed out that Bruce Chilton uh, argued that in Mark's Gospel, in particular, when the Son of Man is spoken about as a futuristic uh, individual coming, coming in the future, uh, then that Son of Man, that futuristic one, is not a reference to Jesus in Mark's Gospel. It's a reference to someone other than Jesus. And uh, so that's an interesting discussion. And we see the same uh, third person reference to the Son of Man here, as if Jesus is speaking about somebody else coming after him. Okay, verse number 24, no disciple is above his teacher, no slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, for the slave that he become like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, uh, how much more those of his household? Uh, so, uh, Jesus here is uh, presenting himself as the one who was called Beelzebul. And, uh, well, I I'm not really so clear now. I was going to say something and then I realized, no, maybe I'm not saying that right. So when ba Jesus was uh, driving out demons, the people were saying uh, that he is driving out demons by Beelzebul, which is like the, the master devil. And um, uh, so... Um, so, so they're calling the master devil Beelzebul, and they will call, you know, his household um, um, much more. But, but the logic somehow escapes me here. I'm not uh, quite grasping it. And maybe some of our Christian listeners will, will explain that, and, and I will get a better understanding of it. And, of course, I'll be curious to look it up later as well. Okay, so we come now to courage under persecution. That's the next uh, heading. Uh, but let me just take a quick peek at the uh, comments, and I see that, uh, yeah, everything still seems to be going fine. I see that um, there are many comments for me to pay attention to, so I'll come back and pay attention to those and try to answer your questions. And in the meantime, I see that uh, several persons have shared the stream. Miftahuddin, uh, thank you, and Hamid, uh, and, and Talman, and uh, Aliyu, and uh, Abdi Ahmed, and Ibrima and uh, Muhammad Mustafa and uh, Abu Bakr Samaila. So thank you all for doing that. May Allah SWT bless you all. And uh, if we say anything useful, may Allah SWT open up the hearts of the and minds of people to accept uh, and to understand what we say. And if what we say is wrong, may Allah SWT forgive us for that. And may Allah SWT guide us to say and do what is right always. Okay, so I'll uh, try to finish up this uh, reading of... Uh, of chapter 10 of Matthew, and then I'll uh, look at your uh, comments uh, and, and questions. Okay, so uh, remember how I said the New American Bible has uh, footnotes? So I can see the footnotes here at the, on the page as well. Hmm, this, is, uh, this is a gem that I've stumbled on today, because the last time I searched for the New American Bible, uh, I, uh, I had to get to it through a complicated uh, process, and uh, I don't recall seeing the footnotes online like this. So this is very nice. So this uh, good credit to BibleGateway.com here. Okay, so um, that means that if I wanted to understand this saying about Beelzebul, I can look at the I in the footnote. So I scroll down to the bottom of the page, and I can see the I. So Beelzebul, okay, it's giving us other passages where... Uh, Beelzebul was mentioned uh, for the charge of linking Jesus with the prince of demons who is named Beelzebul in Matthew chapter 12 verse 24. The meaning of the name is uncertain, possibly Lord of the house. So Beelzebul, Beelze, the, 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 uh, well, huh. okay, <laughs> um, so the, the, um, uh, so, it, but that does not uh, give me any any further insight into uh, that particular saying of Jesus and what it actually means. So, anyway, we go to courage under persecution, uh, starting with verse number twenty six. Therefore, do not be afraid of them. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. What I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light. What you ha hear, wh whispered. Proclaim on the housetops, and do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Jehanna. Uh, you 
are not two are, are not two sparrows sold for a small coin, yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even all the hairs of your head are counted. Uh, so do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly father. So, uh, do not be afraid of them, and nothing is concealed, uh, everything will be uh, made known, and um, uh, what I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light, you hear what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. So, Jesus is teaching his disciples and using them as his amplifiers. They are his mouthpieces, they will go and proclaim the message far and wide. Verse number 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Well, this, um, you know, reflects what we know in the Quran about the martyrs, those who uh, die uh, because uh, they, they, they were persecuted for their faith. Um, and under such persecution they died, they died as martyrs, uh, they're uh, still alive with God. God says, uh, Do not say of those who died in the, uh, who were killed in the, in the way of God, that they are dead, but they are alive. Um, and they're alive with God, and another verse says that uh, God feeds them. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are fed. Um, and so be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in in Jehanna. So Jehanna is a is a word uh, similar in Arabic, Jahannam, uh, probably from the same uh, roots. And God knows best. Um, uh, so would would the soul also be destroyed in Jehanna? So this uh, gives uh, you know uh, rise to various uh, theologies. Uh, but I don't have time to go into it now, nor am I quite schooled in it to be able to say a lot of things meaningful about that. Now I'm going to leave that alone for the time being. Uh, verse number 29. Are not two sparrows sold for, the small, for a small coin, yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge? So he means to say the sparrow is insignificant. So insignificant that uh, you know two of them are, are sold for a small coin. Though it is so worthless in terms of money, but uh, you know God pays pays attention to all of them and uh, he knows the one that falls to the ground. Uh, even all the hairs of your head are counted. So God's knowledge is comprehensive. He knows even the number of hairs on your head. And uh, uh, you, you are worth more than many sparrows. So, you know, the human being is precious. And the Quran confirms that. Well, uh, we have uh, ennobled the uh, children of Adam, uh, says the Quran. And then everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly father. So we thank God that uh, he has uh, led us Muslims to acknowledge Jesus. We acknowledge and we believe in him and uh, so we expect that uh, Jesus will also acknowledge uh, us uh, before God uh, okay Jesus uh, a cause of division so this is continuing with a theme which we already saw in earlier in this chapter and we're getting to the end now so Jesus being a cause of division verse number 34 do not think that I've come to bring peace upon the earth I've come uh, to bring not peace but the sword uh, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's enemies will be those of his household. Now, it's interesting that when the scriptures uh, say, I have come to do this, um, it, it, it doesn't mean that that's their intention. It means that uh, this is the uh, obvious uh, calculated outcome of what they're doing. So Jesus did not come to sow division among people. No, no. He came to give them the right message. And uh, some will accept the right message. Some will deny the right message. And because some accept and some deny, they will be in a clash with each other. So uh, that's how they will be set against each other. Not by deliberate intent on the part of Jesus. Uh, but uh, uh, this can be foreseen that this is going to happen. But it's necessary uh, to, to do what Jesus is doing because the truth has to be told. And uh, people have to hear the right message uh, so that whoever whoever wants to believe let them believe whoever doesn't want to believe let them not believe and that will be uh, to their damnation uh, the uh, conditions of discipleship uh, is the next heading and that's verse number 37 um, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me 
And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So, uh, so you, you have to love um, uh, Jesus more than you love uh, your father and mother and more than your son and your daughter. It's a tall order. And, uh, you know, I, I, we might say a similar uh, thing is found in the Quran in Surah 9, verse number 24, where the Quran uh, says, uh, you know, that uh, if, if all of these things are more dear to you than Allah and his messenger and striving in his way, then um, wait for the punishment that will come uh, from from Allah. Um, so this, uh, and then the uh, among the eight things we have, you know, your your parents and and so on. Kana abakum wa abnaukum wa swajukum wa shiratukum wa malum nitaruftumuha. So it says, you know, your fathers. Some uh, somehow it doesn't say mothers. Maybe there's an exception for mothers here because of the close connection uh, between people and their and their mothers. So I have to think about that some more. I hadn't thought about it until I just uh, tried to say it now that the mothers are not uh, mentioned. Abba is mentioned in the in you know in a general way, and and that could mean all of your ancestors, male and female. Uh, but it's interesting that um, uh, the the um, the you know mothers are not mentioned specifically interesting i'm i'm going to look I'm, i'll be curious to look into the commentaries to see if any of the classical commentators said anything about why mothers are not mentioned there in any case we find a similarity of ideas here that you have to love jesus and of course god um more than anything else but it's a different kind of love you know let not anyone be confused about this and think you know i love my parents so much uh, or i love my children so much um uh, so uh, does that mean like i'm a failure as a believer no it's a different kind of love uh so so we're not talking about a different kind of love uh, yes you will have a different kind of love for god and a different kind of love for your children and a different kind of love for your spouse um uh, so the different kinds of love, but uh, when it comes to a clash, like you know, God tells you to do one thing, and then your children are telling you doing something else. So who are you going to listen to? The children are to God. So obviously, a believer want to want to listen to God. So uh, that that's the test. Is it like who you're going to uh, follow more? Uh, so so that's that's really what it comes down to. Um, the choices that we make, whether we do uh, things that are unlawful in the sight of God, only to please the people of this world. Okay, and now we come to the final section here of, uh, of about three verses. Um, yeah, three verses uh, dealing with rewards. An interesting passage, uh, especially in Muslim Christian debates, uh, because uh, often we are told that, uh, you know, we because Jesus died for our sins, that's uh, how we get saved, and how now we can see. Uh, that there is a system of reward and punishment, just like in, in Islamic faith. Okay, verse number 40. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever receives a righteous man because he is, a, a righteous, because he is righteous will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple Amen. I say to you, uh, he will surely not lose his reward. So there's a system of reward even for giving a cup of, uh, of uh, water to uh, a person, uh, especially the disciples of Jesus. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, everything is accounted for. Everything will be uh, rewarded. Uh, notice that uh, Jesus is setting up a hierarchy here and showing, you know, whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. And whoever receives the prophet will receive get the prophet's reward. So uh, whoever receives the disciples, they're in turn receiving Jesus. And uh, whoever receives uh, Jesus uh, is receiving the one who sent Jesus. So there's the father who sent Jesus, and then Jesus sends his disciples. So you can see this kind of hierarchy there. And that shows that Jesus is not God. He is not equal with God. There is a hierarchy of um, beings here, um, or of, of status. And um, so that brings me to uh, the end of this uh, discussion here. Uh, of Matthew chapter 10, and uh, I'll be glad to look at your questions and comments. Uh, just a quick thing that came to my mind, uh, you know, the um, Jesus said to them in this chapter that whoever uh, perseveres to the end will be saved. That's in verse number 22. So again, the question is, what must I do to be saved? Uh, the, the answer must be here, 
uh, to endure to the end. So, uh, you know, you have to continue with the right teachings to the end. And this is why we find in Islamic uh, uh, stories uh, that, uh, uh, you know, righteous people don't consider themselves to be saved. They say, you know, let, let, me, persecute, let me persevere to the end. And uh, because uh, no sense saying that you were saved now and then later on you couldn't perse persevere to the, to the end. Who knows what your end is really going to be. We hope and we plan uh, for our end to be on the right faith, uh, but we have to persevere. And that's the humility that we're taught as uh, Muslims. Okay, so I now come to your uh, questions and comments. And uh, looking here, what do I see? I see... Okay, Christopher saying good day, Dr. Shabir, and good day to you. Assalamu alaikum from Abdul Malik, wa alaikum assalam, and assalamu alaikum from Shariful Islam, wa alaikum assalam as well. And Hamidu uh, is saying, assalamu alaikum, Dr. Shabir, my question relates to zakat. Since 2020, I have savings of roughly 3,000 pounds on two different accounts, uh, which generate no interest for me. I do earn monthly wages as well, but Allah bears witness to me. I am unable to make further savings due to my numerous personal expenditures, as well as some done on behalf of others. I offer no zakat, unfortunately, due to the above reasons. Is zakat still mandatory on me with regards to my savings and wages? Okay, so Hamidou, you have to um, please uh, look at um, what the scholars in your country are saying uh, is, is what is called the nisab of, of zakat. Uh, I, I, I suspect that, that your, your 3,000 pounds uh, do not reach the level of nisab because uh, usually nisab is said to be three and a half ounces of gold. Some uh, computed based on silver and, and when they computed based on silver, given the price of silver and the disparity between the prices of silver and gold, uh, the, the nisab amount is much lower. So if, if one wants to be totally cautious, one would calculate based on the nisab of silver, which is like uh, 21 ounces of silver. And what is the price of 21 ounces of silver? Um, it, it just comes to a couple of hundred dollars. So I'm thinking dollars because, you know, obviously I'm in Canada. Um, uh, so I'm not accustomed to the prices of things in pounds. Um, so in, in terms of uh, gold, uh, the, the price of uh, three and a half ounces of gold uh, or, or three ounces of gold, I forget the exact measure now, so I have to look it up. Um, then, you know, that will come up to about 5,000 uh, Canadian dollars, which is probably um, just about your 3,000 pounds. So, so check with your local scholars to see what they're saying is in this side. And, and then if you want to take the cautious uh, um, a root, then you will say, okay, let's price it based on silver, and I would consider myself a pair of zakat because I've reached that nisab amount, because I have that much equivalent of uh, 21 ounces of silver. And then you would give um, a zakat based on that. Now, you said you help other people. So what you would want to do over time is that when you're helping other people, like think consciously, does this qualify as zakat? And then, you know, count that as your zakat. So when it comes to the year end, when it's time to pay your zakat, because the, from the time you first get the, the, the nisab amount, um, then you qualify as a zakat payer. Let, let, let's say they tell you that the nisab amount is, uh, you know, 500 uh, pounds uh, based on silver and you say okay I want to go with that so uh, from the first time you got that amount uh, a year later is when you're going to pay on what you have at the moment and uh, so uh, what you have at the moment at the end of the year so you're going to pay the two and a half percent of that but you can pay it in advance so when you're helping other people you can compute in your mind and note it down so you don't forget that okay I've given this much as my zakat so when it comes to the year end you don't have to give it again you've already given it um, so so that's one way of doing it and of course if you're comfortable with the idea that it's uh, based on uh, the um, the gold uh, value uh, then uh, probably you do not reach the nisab, um, and in which case you do not have to give zakat. But even then, if your scholars in your area tell you you have reached the nisab based on that amount, then you will need to give the zakat in a similar way which I've already uh, described. And may Allah subhanahu wa help you, and may Allah bless you and bless your earnings so that you are able to make ends meet and also that you're able to save and uh, increase uh, your savings. And may Allah protect you and all of your loved ones. May Allah give you barakas. So you are never short of anything in this world or the life hereafter. Okay, Brother Ihsan saying assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam and Muhammad Ali is saying wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and um, 
Muhammad is Zain. Uh, Muhammad Zain. So, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, not you know, not intentionally, of course. Uh, uh, but so I'm trying to spell it. Uh, pronounce it as quickly as I can and sometimes I mispronounce okay and saying assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi so I think those are all of the um, comments that I see that require my uh, response and uh, if there are others and if I miss them uh, please uh, forgive me for that and um, please continue to pray for me and um, uh, so normally I do my live post on Sunday and I've done it on Saturday today and um, so I'll, I'll see what to do about tomorrow. Um, um, maybe I'll do another one tomorrow, but um, I cannot guarantee it at this moment. And um, I'll, I'll let you know if, uh, um, if I'm doing it. And I see from Zoe, Zoe uh, Boulet saying, thank you, Brother Shabir. I enjoy learning from your perspective. Thank you. Thank you, my... Um, I, I don't know if to say brother or sister Zoe. I see the whole family there in the picture. And may Allah SWT bless you all. Jazakum Allah khairan. Thank you all for joining. And again, those who have uh, shared the post, I thank you all very much. May Allah SWT bless you all. And uh, may Allah SWT keep you in good health and uh, in high state of uh, faith. Uh, may Allah SWT bless you in this life and the life hereafter. May Allah SWT bless all of the people around you, protect you all from COVID-19, from monkeypox, from every sickness and disease and stress and distress. May Allah SWT protect the people of Pakistan who are suffering from the recent flood. Uh, may Allah SWT protect all of the people who are suffering all over the world. And uh, may Allah SWT bring peace and justice to our torn and broken world. Thank you again for joining me. Jazakum Allah khairan. Peace and the mercy and blessings of Allah be with you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.